हेलो फ्रेंड्स यू आर वाचिंग एडिस इंग्लिश लिटरेचर आई एम अर्धन दू दे टुडे वी आर गोईंग टू अंडारस्टैंड एंड क्रिटिकली एनालाइज जर्ज हार्वर्ड्स भार्चू उल फाइंड इट हाउ लिरिकल दिस पोएम इज उल फाइंड आउट द म्यूजिक मिलोडी एंड उल अल्सो नोट डाउन हाउ सिम्पल द लैंगुएज इज द स्पन्टेनिटी एंड द इंटेंसिटी अफ दि रिलिजियस फेवर that you will also find out from this poem as you all know it is a metaphysical poem so first few words on george herbert's poetry and its metaphysical school of artistry it was samuel johnson who first christened the dan and his schools of followers the metaphysical poets that he has noted down in the life of kaule in fact in the beginning of the 17th century appeared a race of writers uh, who may be termed as metaphysical poets for their ingenious use of concepts and what play no doubt john dan is the torch bearer of that school of writing george harvard is also an that school of poetry that is metaphysical he was a university of cambridge graduate but was a kind of unsuccessful uh, in getting a play at the court being unemployed for 7 years he um, tried in, in different form of artistry so that he can exhibit based of his skills later he devoted secularism Uh, a kind of a ambition uh, that he took a kind of a holy order or religious order by 1630 he became uh, the part of church of england he spent rest of his life as rector in bemarton in his writing we are chiefly remembering him for his religious poems the poem that we all know the temple the collection of poetry uh, comparing with dan his poetry is quite simple uh, it is a kind of devoutness a kind of religious fervor is always his metaphysical quality in his poetry is his usual conceits in the blending of thoughts and feelings his poetry has precision of language metrical versatility ingenious use of imagery conceits uh the temple that we are talking about as it has been given as is had as it has been given the title sacred poems private ejaculation it was posthumously published in fact in harvard that kind of emotional seesaw between a soaring confidence in love and uh, the appeal to physicality as well as appeal to god the supreme father that tug of war that tug of tension or that oscillation and vacillation that conflict is the very essence of his poetry and this particular poem bhartu that we are going to read is also a notable example of his oscillation and vacillation between the end of finding out the true devoutness true god the or the true essence of spirituality Bharchu which is included in the temple sacred poems and the private ejaculations is a didactic poem it teaches us that bharchu is supreme and superlastic in this world of impermanence beautiful things and beauty itself are subject to decay death and destruction but a truly bharchuous soul remains unchanged throughout this page of our living and it is a kind of eternal feeling so the soul is the very entity of us the soul is the very spiritual acclaim of us that is undying that is not having its death so everything is the subject of death and decay and destruction and changes but soul is supreme this particular poem is a supreme example of his metaphysical presentations 
the blending of thought and feeling in through metaphysical concentration, unification of sensible learnedness. But here is another trait. The metaphysical concept is presented through not through the sacred imageries but through religious imageries. The imageries are often hidden, concentrated. And that's the beauty of this poem. In virtue, Harvard speaks of the permanence of a virtuous soul that I am talking about. All the beautiful things of this world including a sweet day, a sweet rose and the sweet spring are subject to decay but a virtuous soul, an entity of our spiritual acclaim that enjoins with our God remains unchanged. To assist his points, Harvard uses three images in this poem. First, he speaks of a sweet day, which must come to an end, the swallowed up by the dark night. Secondly, he refers to a sweet rose, which in spite of its sweet color, fragrance is destined to wither. Thirdly, he speaks of a spring, which with its music and color, is damaged to sink into oblivion. So, we are now reading this poem and line by line we will try to understand the very meaning of the text. The meaning of the text is coming through the metaphysical concepts, through the imageries which are hard enough. You need a mental design or a learnedness to understand these images. Sweet day, so cool, so calm, so bright, the bridal of the earth and sky, the dew shall weep thy fall tonight, for thou must die. The lines are very simple. Harvard visualizes a sweet day which is cool, calm and bright. He fancies that the day represents the wedding of the earth and the sky, as if they have worked together in order to bring about the day which is so bright. A cool, calm, bright day must come to an end with the passage of time. With the passing of time, we meet the night, the fall of night. So if the sweet day pass by, who should weep? The dew shall weep because the sweet day will die night. The evening dew is regarded here as the weeps or the tears of this nature. Here the tear of mourning over the death of the sweet day has been referred to the dew drops. Here, in this first stanza, Harvard presents a serene yet invigorated day and locates the reader in the celestial and terrestrial realm and that happens simultaneously. The day in its loveliness brings them together. But when it comes to an end, the dark night falls and everything is black. So even the day is so sweet, so bright, it comes to a logical end. The day gives way to night, just as life gives way to death. Here the metaphysical extension. Here the poet Herbert asserts, turning a daily natural event, the nightfall, into the metaphoric design. Beyond death, the line also suggests grief as at the loss of the paradise of earth. So here the religious metaphor is there. The fall, which is the original cause of death in the Christian story of the creation. The evening dew invested with emotion and made to represent grief is equated with tears, human tears, which are said at nightfall. Over the fall of humanity, the scene that brought death into the world. The line says, The dew shall weep thy fall tonight, for thou must die. 
So even the sweet, beautiful day died with all the times, with all the sins it has. Even though it is bright, it meets the night. Next, the poet speaks of a lovely, delightful rose. The second stanza. The sweet rose has a bright red color which indicates its angry mood and it is adding a splendid look at it. The line says, Sweet rose, whose hue angry and brave bids the rash gazer wipe his eye. Thy root is ever in its grave and thou must die. According to the poet, the rose seems to be asking the onlooker to, to wipe the tears from his eyes as it knows that it must fade away and then die. The color dazzles the eye of the onlooker. So even the rose is so attractive, so appealing, so beauty haunting, but it also meets its final destination of death and decay and destruction. Nothing can save the onslaught of time, the onslaught of passing of time. So the day meets the end at night and the rose loses its petals and die. The same imagery is continued. The spring in the third stanza is pictured here in a full of sweet days and colorful and fragrant flowers and is compared to a box full of sweets to denote the sweetness and beauty of the season and the beauty of the season too. There are plenty of reasons to find this season beautiful because sweet spring full of sweet days and roses, a box where sweets compacted lie. My music shows a have your closes and all must die. Now here the metaphysical imagery is extended to nature and to music, composition of the music. The delights of the spring presented in the first two quatrains as it is in the case of day and roses are also containing in this third stanza. The poet narrator solidifies his suggestion of the earth's rich bounty. But the poet asserts that spring with its music, color, fragrance is destined to sing into oblivion. Only by the very verse of the poet being read reserves its glory but it has its close close you know close is a very technical term in music indicating the resolution of musical phrase thus the poetic parts like everything else the narrator has so far depicted must come to a logical end as he temporarily does with the four traced and conclusive bits of the twelfth line it's a close so here, the spring must have a close. Spring also ends as like that of a musical notice. So the extended metaphor is here from season to that of music. Last quadrant presents images of eternal soul. Only a sweet and virtuous soul like seasoned timber never gives. But though the whole world turn to coal, then cheaply lives. Through a metaphoric explanation, the poet says that a seasoned timber cannot be burnt and changed into coal. And therefore it never surrender to erosion or corrosion. Similarly, the virtuous and prosperous soul in us, awakening of us, remains unchanged in spite of the passing of time.
in 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 spite of the passage of time flow the fridge turned to coal means totally destroyed it implies that the whole world will be destructed with the passage of time with the passing of time by chiefly leaves the poet means that the soul will remain alive when the world will remain no more as such is the case the entire poem which all along warned of death shows the way in which harban believes that he and his readers may achieve eternal life and root awakening soul understanding the ever living soul and the soul that is attached to the supreme father the lord of life or the eternity the god so i think you have got the points and start reading this particular poem without any fear if you have any questions in way of understanding any line or phrase i know it's a metaphysical poem little bit difficult than other poems you can ask freely any of the questions that you will find in your way of learning i will try my best to give answers like share comment and obviously subscribe to my channel to stay tuned to this kind of posts bye bye